freely speaking, will remember that we had the privilege a year or so ago of interviewing in Geneva Sheikh Al Haj Ahmed Didat, who is president of the IPCI, that's the Islamic Propagation Center International, in Durban, South Africa. And it was amazing for me, some of my Islamic friends in Geneva had called and said you were coming, and I didn't know this existed, I did not know about you, and it was very interesting to have our first conversation together. So since time has passed, and I am now in Durban myself, I would like to bring our audience into your center and hear you speak from your heart about your center, Islam in general, and then we'll expand out. You are most world. welcome. You are most welcome. Thank you, you very much audience. for letting us come. So let's start about Durban and Islam. How did it come here? Muslims that touched the shores of South, Southern, South Africa were Muslims who were brought here by the Dutch. You see, when the Dutch people conquered Indonesia, those Muslims were fighting for their freedom. They were captured as prisoners of war, and they were shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. <coughs> then when the British conquered Malaysia, those Malays, Muslims, were fighting for their freedom. They were also captured as prisoners of war, and they were also shipped to the Cape of Good Hope, Good Hope for the white men, and sold to the white men as slaves. For 300 years, those early Muslim, first Muslims have touched these shores and they have it under pressure from the Christians to Christianize them. But after 300 years of hammering, that group of people, they have become one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world. That hammering, instead of softening them, had hardened them as steel. Now you see, when you say they have become one of the most militant groups of Muslims, again, my Christian background forces me to ask, militant towards whom and to what? Because if one, there's one thing that Christianity and Islam have in common, it's that everybody is fighting everybody yes. everywhere. Yes. So who is militant to whom in Islam around here? Yes. No, it's the militancy is in its defense, because they were under pressure, under attack. You see, the white man managed to change his names, surnames. They are almost all these people that are called Malays in this country today. Malays? They are called Malays. Aha. Malays, like Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Malays. Though they were originating in Indonesia and in Malaysia, they are all called Malays. Mm -hmm. right. Now, that community of people, you see, because they were under pressure, the defense mechanism was also. Uh, it was not a soft, they were militant in their defense mm -hmm. against the Christian missionaries. Yes. And that, that, that type of psychology remained with them. That was the one group of Muslims. And the, another group of Muslims came from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. Now, they came to this country because they were starving yes. in India. Uh -huh. So they came looking for a livelihood. So they settled down in, mostly in Natal and the Transvaal and the Malays mostly in the Cape, because that's where they were taken in the first instance. I see. So the white men managed to change the names of these people. They all carry Western names. Like you'll find a Muslim name, it's a Yusuf Hendricks, Abdullah hmm. Fenter. So what is Fenter? What is Hendricks? What is Smith? So he says, no, 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 these were our slave masters. They carried the names of the slave masters, exactly as in America. Exactly the same, same thing happened in, here. Yes. But now, with this difference, the 300 years of hammering that the Afro-Americans uh, received in, in America, it chained them all to Christianity. This 300 years of hammering in Southern Africa <laughs> made them better Muslims than the Muslims at home. Right, then let me ask you a hard question right away, and yes. that is, if 300 years of Christians uh, hammering, hammering at the Muslims right. didn't change them, right. why would you think that 300 years now of Muslims hammering at, hammering at Christians would change them? 
In no, other words, no, no. I, because okay. it, the Islamic Propagation Center right, is that right. not to spread Islam okay, okay. to the it world. Is, it is. To, to the world. Including Muslims, Christians. Muslims, Jews, Christians, and to all. You expect Christians to resist for 300 no. years? No, no. You see, no? If, if the right approach is there, you see, there is an approach. The approach of the Christian missionaries and the Christians then was yeah. a harsh approach. Like what they did to the American Negroes in America, same type of treatment was given to the Muslims here. But now, one gave in because they had no, somehow, they didn't have that type of background, religious background, to resist conversion. These people had, they go the Malays, mm -hmm. they had something, basic knowledge about religion, which kept them together. Now, in our approach today, you see, we are using a technique of speaking to a people, the Jews and the Christians, according to their own background and experience. The message that were used by the Christian missionaries was, in the past, attacking Islam, attacking the Holy Prophet Muhammad, attacking the Quran, and that didn't get their honey. But we are not attacking Jesus or uh, the Christian people. What we are saying is, we, are, have, we have an approach where we are calling the people, says, come, let us reason together. And in that, we say, we want to show you from your own background and experience that it was about time that you look for a person who would give you a solution to all your problems. Because we say that Jesus Christ, before he parted, he told his disciples, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now, meaning you haven't got the capacity. He had the knowledge, he had the solution to our problems for eternity. Who Jesus Christ is the mighty as a man of God, as a mighty messenger of God, as a messiah, he had answers to all your problems. Mm -hmm. But the people to whom he was addressing, they were incapable of receiving that message. So he says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Now we Muslims, we are claiming that that spirit of truth or that comforter as prophesied by Jesus is Muhammad and he is giving you a solution to all your problems. Those solutions might not go down well because we are all used to certain ways of living, thinking. But if you sit and reason, these are solutions to your problems, whatever problem you have. In South Africa, the biggest problem we have is race. And throughout the world, the biggest problem ma of mankind is racism. Mm -hmm. And Islam not only speaks about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, it gives you a solution to your problem, how to solve it. It lays out a system. Whereas everybody else talks, fatherhood of God, there is but one Lord, He created us all, and we are all His children. That is talk. But how to create that brotherhood? In Islam, we have a system. Mm -hmm. Now the system is, you see, five times a day, the Muslim is made to come together. Yes. In what is called Salat, prayer. Mm -hmm. So when they gather together in the mosque, mm -hmm. they use the same taps for ablution, they use the same towels for wiping the faces, and they stand shoulder to shoulder, no gaps left between the rich and the poor, the black and the white, or whatever. They all must stand shoulder to shoulder. Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad he said that when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps for the devil to get in between you and your brother. Now the devil he was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery in Durban. If you go to the museum complex, you see there uh, in the art gallery beautiful paintings by great artists. Among them there is one huge painting of a beautiful woman with wings. And she's got a wand in her hand. A that horse. magic wand, W-A-N-D. A, a wand. wand. A wand. wand. wand in her hand, as if, and she's directing the devil in the picture, you can see, she's directing the devil to go to hell, and you can see hell in the distance, and you see this devil with horns, mm -hmm. with sharp ears, and a tail with a barbed hook, mm -hmm. with a ready complexion, mm -hmm. fiery himself, and he's flying off also towards hell. Uh -huh. right. Now that devil, if anybody saw, he will run for dear life, we flee for our life. So Muhammad wasn't talking about that. He was talking about you yourself, we ourselves. You know, our racial pride, our arrogance, our riches. I am white, he is black. 
and I am rich, he is poor. That devil must not be allowed to come in between you and your brother. So five times a day, the Muslims gather together, stand shoulder to shoulder. Then in a bigger circle, on Fridays, more people gather from different districts. And on the occasion of two of our festivals, what we call Eid, one after the fasting season, and another one after two months and ten days after that, another big feast. There when we gather together in an open field, again, people, wider group comes along together. Then. Once a year in Mecca, the whole Muslim community from all over the world, you know, the blonde haired and blue eyed Turk and uh, the, the darkest coal uh, Ethiopian Muslim and the Chinese Muslim and from Muslims from all over the world together in the same pilgrim's garb, which creates a type of brotherhood and unity. There is a system, not only talking, but a system is laid out, which no other religious group of people have. They all talk but there's no system of bringing people together. But still, if I may say, and we're engaged in an academic exercise, right, right. but Christianity, Judaism, Islam, right. Hinduism, right. these are systems one way or the other, perhaps not as elaborate as Islam, right. but they are systems of people coming together to worship what is one God with the exception of uh, Hinduism, right. perhaps they have more. And yet, when you quoted the Bible, you said, and yet he who comes after me... Uh, when he, the spirit of truth... The spirit of truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you translate what Christians call the Holy Spirit right. into the same thing that this is known as, in, in other words, a little bit towards the mystical idea, right. then in the, the, the mystical idea of what he who comes after me, if each one of us can practice our formal parts of the religion, but be inspired by that invisible and nameless, absolutely, there's no way one can, can explain or the experience of having experienced the living presence of the Holy Spirit. Does that not go beyond your practice and my practice and the practice of our neighbor? And doesn't that unite us in, a, in an invisible world toward this thing that you call Allah and I call God? You see, it sounds very nice, beautiful, but mankind, he needs simple, straightforward directives. For example, now, you are a good-hearted person. You in your heart and mind might have no uh, racial prejudice whatsoever. You can cultivate that. But the billions of the world, no matter how much you talk about uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, you see, the person is simultaneously being programmed that that neighbor must be one like yourself, belonging to your church. See, the wordings are identical. You say, love thy neighbor as thyself. Beautiful. Who is your neighbor? So the Afrikaner is trained. What actually happens is this. He said, no, as long as that other one is also an Afrikaner and belonging to my church. He's not a Jehovah's Witness. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist. He's not a Roman Catholic. See, so though he utters the words all right, but in his mind he has made up, he said, look, the African is not my neighbor. That's how it was for 300 years. I don't know now what will happen, but this is the programming. So what we need is simple directives. What does this Supreme Being, this Holy Spirit, tell you in clear-cut language about races? How did the races come about? Who is better than the other? Is it white or black? Or brown? The color? The mixture? What? Who is the best? So. There is not another system which gives an answer like the Islamic system gives you. It says in the Holy Quran, it says, Ya Yuhannas, it says, O mankind, Inna khalaqna kum min zakarim wa unsa. It says, Most certainly it is we who have created you all of a male and a female, common origin. Yes. Wa ja'alna kum shu'uban wa qabaila. And it is we who have made you into nations and tribes. Who God Almighty is talking? What for? He says, لِتَعَارَفُ That you may recognize one another. This Mr. John is an Englishman. That other Mr. John is an Afrikaner. This Mr. John is a Frenchman. This John is an Indian. These are convenient labels for recognizing people, says this holy book, the Book of Islam. But we have a tendency to create our own false standards of judging. Despite all this, look, you were made from, we come from Father Adam, you know, we are all his children. That is what we all say, like especially the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims. 
But in their hearts and minds, the man says, I'm a Jew. We are the chosen people. The rest of the world is goyim, Gentiles, unclean. Right? The Christian also, he says, look, yes, yes, we believe in the Father of God and the brother of man, but for 300 years, you ask the Africana, he doesn't consider the African as his equal, even belonging to his church. The Indian belonging to his church is still not equal. And the Roman Catholic Church, which is claiming to be the most universal, Catholic, most universal. I have been living here in Durban, on the same street as the cathedral, mm -hmm. just around the corner here. And on that street, as a young man, I used to watch the Corpus Christi procession every year. Yes. Corpus Christi, mm -hmm. the body yes. of Christ. And he used to come out from the cathedral, walk through Cathedral Road, I lived in, number 40, Cathedral Road. And year in and year out, I watched. They had some like a canopy like thing and the priests uh, under the canopy and they yes. were marching. Yes. I can't remember the more details than that. Then I used to see the whites, men, women and children, and behind them the coloreds, men, women and children, behind them the Indians, men, women and children, and behind them the Africans, men, women and children. Invariable arrangement. No change. Year in and year out. The white man first, then comes the colored, that's a mixture between black and white, then comes the Indian, then comes the African. And everybody knows his place. How did it happen? You are being programmed. Okay, this is how it ought to be. You see, the Indian is before the African, and the colored is before the Indian, and the white man is before all. Mr. Dida, <clears throat> I agree with what you say. In Islam, yes. all men are brothers, and everybody is equal. I'm going to accept that totally at face value. Then I would like to ask you to speak, if you will, to the following two points. Right. Number one. In that case, let's move to Afghanistan and please tell me why all those Muslims are fighting each other in Afghanistan, in Russia, and in uh, Azerbaijan, and in, uh, the, in the part of Iran. Who are they and why are they fighting all of each other if they are brothers and equals? To Afghanistan. <clears throat> right. The battle there was first between the communists who were ruling and the bulk of the people who were good simple Muslims and they were asking for their freedom against the communist rule in their own country Afghanis by Afghanis mm -hmm. right. then Russia jumps in onto the bandwagon to help the communists to communize the whole country yes and the war took place and after how many years ten years or so the Russians had to leave they left the country mm -hmm. left it to their own the DVA and the, uh, divide whatever More or device, less. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, it's human nature. It's human nature that now the people who have been helping you, they have certain motives, and they have been exploiting it. For example, now, uh, one group of people, the mujahideen, means those people who are fighting for the freedom. Mm -hmm. They were helped by <coughs> Iran. <coughs> so they would in that process they'll be trying to make them to accept the philosophy of the Iranians. That's one faction of the That's one Jaya, faction. Yes. Another faction, they say the Saudis are helping them. They'll want to make them to think as they are thinking. Another section is helped by Pakistanis. Voila. The Pakistanis want you know, says, look, uh, when everything is over, we want you to become one with us. So all these are power politics. The human being is... And five times a day, they're right, all lining right, up right, together right, right, with right, no devil right, in between. Right, right, uh -huh. right, right. <laughs> right. So now, the, the devil there we were talking about was, mm. number one, getting mm. rid of first was your racial and all the other prejudices. But now, they still they pray together, but now, what happens is this, that in the end, the loot, how are you going to share this? You know, the rule. How are you going to rule this country? So the one is brainwashed to say that the ideal way of running this country is on a communist basis, with the followers ruling there now. The other guy says, no, 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 no. It must be Islamic the way the Iranians see it. The other guy says, no, no, it really should be Islamic, but as the Pakistani sees it. So this is that human, this thing, and the, and the devil in between, that somebody is running around, trying to see that they remain in this situation. Then what are the plain, simple rules of the Quran to correct that right. overnight? No, the, no, not overnight. What the, the rule is, go back to the book. No. Go to the book. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with most people, nobody really goes to the book. The second thing I would like to ask you is, 
in this wonderful and it and we're having fun here too yes, part yes, of, you yes, know? <clears throat> but in this wonderful Islamic Center you are gentlemen as I I see everybody here that I look at yes. uh, is a male so far yes now suppose you went home tonight every one of these distinguished gentlemen yes and all of your daughters chose this day to tell you right. that they had decided to marry the Jewish boy down the street right. Right. or the Christian right. boy that was walking around. Right. Suppose that, um, I mean, any of these things, I don't have to elaborate further. Mm. Young people, um, often they start all these things and then how do you speak to them when you say look the Jew is my brother the Christian is my brother but we don't get married and then you come back to white doesn't want to marry black and then everybody passes laws so first of all Afghanistan and they're all fighting each other and secondly intermarriage or what they decided what if your son came home and said I have been a good Muslim for 30 years but suddenly I have decided to become a Christian I mean, so what do you say? Yes. Okay. Your second question about marriage. Islam tells us, see, in detail now, whom we can and whom we can't. We follow this biblical injection to the letter where the Bible says that an idolater or an idolatress thou shalt not marry. Now we who uphold that. An idolater and an idolatress thou shalt not marry. So my son falls in love with a Hindu girl. My religion says, no, you can't marry her. No matter how beautiful she is, no matter how much she allures. One, he said, you can't marry. Now, racially, with the Hindus, most of the Hindus, we are one language group. We have the same racial stock. We carry the same surnames. We enjoy the same dishes. But because of our religious uh, concept, idea of God, my religion says, no, you can't marry an idolater or an idolatress. I can, my religion allows me to marry a Christian woman or a Jewess. It does allow you it to marry? It does allow, yes. It does I allow. Know that. Reason, the reason. There's a reasoning behind it. He said, look, we are so close. If I marry a Christian, a Jewess, for example, I would be the last man to say anything abusive about any of the Jewish heroes. Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, we have the highest respect for them. So this wife of mine, a Jewess, she will be still at home with me. In other words, I respect Moses, I respect David, Solomon, all the prophets. What do I am going to tell her with her and reason with her is, so come dear, now come a step forward. You have been at a certain level of religious education. Come two steps forward. One is to accept Jesus and then accept Muhammad as well. So I am asking her to come to a higher level of understanding religion. To the Christian woman, in this country when I said that at first, that look, we are allowed to marry Christian women. So the white men in the audiences, when I delivered talks, they were thinking, say, ah, yeah, yeah, I know why. So I said, why? He said, just because we are whites. You think now marrying a white woman is a superior thing to do? I said, no, no, no. Even if the Christian woman is an African woman, she is a Hottentot, she is a Bushman, she is Christian, I can marry her. Because again, we are so close. We accept Jesus as one of the mightiest messengers of God. We accept him as the Messiah. We accept his miraculous birth. We accept his many miracles. The only point of real difference between me and my spouse, that Christian lady would be, that I would say, look, he is not God. He is not the begotten son of God. But everything else, we have a common denominator. We have one with the Jew. We have a common denominator with the Christian. So we said, we can get them and more easily they can be absorbed in the house of Islam. Because whatever you believe, we believe, plus a step further. But now my daughter can't marry a Hindu man, nor can she marry a Jew, nor can she marry a Christian. Now the Hindu is understood being an idol worshipper. But now you say, what about the Jew and the Christian? I can marry a Jewess and I can marry a Christian woman. Why can't my daughter marry a Jew or mm -hmm. a Christian? Yeah. Now the reason is that you see the Christian husband of my daughter, he's got no respect for Muhammad. He's going to use an offensive language. He's going to say Muhammad is an imposter. Why? Because that's Not his training. No, that's his training. Because as soon as you say, as soon as you say that you accept Muhammad as a prophet, you are a Muslim. You see, when you say, you have, I say, look, Muhammad, you, you will say, look, Muhammad was a great man. 
Everybody says so. He was a mighty man. You know, he created a nation and an empire and a religion. He is supposed to have left behind a book, like the Quran. So he said, look, I take off my hat to the man. He's the great. And so many people say he was one of the greatest men that ever lived. Michael H. Hart, in his top hundred. He puts Muhammad number one. Yes. Jews, Masarman. You know, in his uh, book on, on the Turks, the history of the Turks. Top hundred men. Right. In the top hundred. I mean, then Jews, Masarman. Yeah, in in the, the, the history, who are history's great leaders. And La Martin, in his history of the Turks. He says, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of human greatness, who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? He's daring people, bring your candidates. So in other words now, from that point of view, the Christian, the Westerner, will be prepared to concede that Muhammad was a great man. But he was an imposter. In other words, he was, not, he was a false prophet. So that's the biggest barrier now. Because if you accept that he was also a prophet, prophet means that God chose him. If God chose Muhammad, now Muhammad tells you that the flesh of the swine thou shalt not eat. Now you can say, look, I like pork chops. You know, all my life I've been enjoying it. He said, look, this man, he's a prophet of God and he's authorized by God to tell you now, don't eat the pig, don't drink alcohol, no promiscuousness, don't dance or court or date women. So, at every step now, if you believe in this man, that he is a prophet of God, you have to listen to him. It's not just a word saying, I believe he's a prophet. It means nothing. When you say he is a prophet of God, what does it imply? It means that he is chosen by God. Now, if he's chosen by God to guide you, to tell you now according to your capacity now, that you are not to touch alcohol, you are not to take interest, you are not, whatever he tells you, it becomes binding on you, which you are not prepared to accept. Who? the Jew or the Christian. Mr. Dida, I have to... I, last time I was really afraid to bring these things up because you seem to me a very holy man and I respect you for that. But sir, there are just too many things... I mean, everybody is so human and you must know that there are people of great Islamic tradition, particularly we see them in Geneva, it just happens to be a place where many come, who do not observe one single one hardly of the things you said and they're pretty famous Islamic people and then they go back home and they put on uh, the raiment or they they respect the things only at a certain period and time now I'm not saying that you have a monopoly on the hypocrites because Christianity <laughs> is absolutely full of them and I suppose every other religion is too <clears throat> but you know what what God says and does and what prophets say and do is so far from from the least of these thy brethren that uh, sometimes it really seems hopeless including for the Muslims if you excuse me for saying so no no I would say that look no no community in his right mind can claim to be perfect we all have our black sheep whether you are a Jew or a Christian yes. Hindu or Muslim we all have our shortcomings but uh, this American, um, he wrote a book, The Messenger. Uh, in that book he says that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. Professing. Mm -hmm. But, he says, he continues, but there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. And if you had come here uh, this morning, say before 12, Around one o'clock I could have taken you to the mosque and of course today and it would have been out because today was Friday and on Fridays there's no place even for us in the mosque. This mosque next door to us here, it holds 4,000 people on Fridays. But any ordinary day, any weekday, if you come there, you find that there's more than a thousand people in the middle of the day. More than a thousand people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. Mm -hmm which you will not find in the Catholic cathedral on Sunday. So, so what is it? How does it work? So as far as the practice of religion is concerned, we have our hypocrites, we have our black sheep. But on a percentage basis, there's not another community, religious community on earth, another community which is as responsive to the religious injection as the Muslim, with all our shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Whatever you describe in Geneva, it, we can also describe anywhere else, in London or New York or anywhere. Yes. I accept. You know, 
but says, I mean, we are not perfect examples of our, our, our religion. But as a people, as a whole, now when you judge, you judge a system according to the whole. That in South Africa we are boasting, and nobody has contradicted me, that in South Africa we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. Yeah, I'm we, quite we sure. have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. And we have the uh, lowest suicide rate in the country. And the highest charity rate in the country. And nobody has been able to contradict me. So in other words, what does it? Everything else is the same. What does it in this environment? No, it's the teaching. Because the Muslim is being programmed five times a day, so to say, when he goes for prayer. He's being programmed, he's being programmed. So he's the least racist. I can't say he's free from racism. We are pure yes. angels. But he's the least racist. He's alcohol. He's the lowest. In everything else is the lowest. And in charity rate is the highest. What does it? It's the programming. Because there is a system. Islam gives you a system that bringing people together, bringing people together, that doesn't eliminate you know, all our sicknesses because it's the type of programming that you're going to receive. And it's only the superficial contact with religion which is creating this. Superficial. But now, in the Christian community, the Seventh-day Adventists and uh, the Mormon community are used in... Uh, they have the same uh, attention to no alcohol and to very healthy right, eating right, right. and to the proper diet and all the rest of the things and they practice more and they're used in in medical experiments people go to test hearts and what have you because they know that they are far more uh, faithful practicers of religious interdictions right. than uh, members of other communities right. and that is uh, it, it's obviously a tremendous plus but uh, coming back we have I think that the smallness of the community that does that. Because the community is so small. Yes. There's sex, sex, sex. So they can keep together, keep together, keep on inspiring one another, brainwashing one another. But as soon as the thing gets big, like you say, the Roman Catholic Church, this is, it gets unwieldy. The Anglican Church gets unwieldy. It's the numbers now counts. The bigger the number, the less cohesive the community will be. True, but you are how many hundred years later? You have six hundred years after. Six hundred years, years after. after so perhaps it could be it could be projected or suggested that in Islam you've got six hundred more years to go before even Islam will start to be. It could be uh, the same as these other religions, which get a little bit watered down. Which brings me back, if I may, to yes. two points. We yes, have twelve minutes to go. Yes, uh, in, I'd like for you to finish about the, you said the daughters could not marry outside, Correct. but the, but the uh, sons could. Uh, not, men could. not to all, except to Jewish and Christians. Yeah, okay. The, the good women among them. And okay. so then I would like to know about the children. Uh, if you married a Muslim lady, and the, I mean, if you, excuse married me, if you marry a Christian, what, how does Mohammed teach about the children right. of those marriages? And then after that, I would like to know about what the uh, religion says about converting, about becoming missionaries for Islam as the Christians have become missionaries. Yes, if you could speak yes, to those yes, two yes, points. Yes, yes. You see, with regards to the um, marriage, uh, you want to know... Uh, what happens, what does Muhammad teach about the children oh, right. of these... Now, the, in the house of Islam, the children are automatically the fathers. They follow the father's religion. So in other words, now, it was at the, it's understood at the back of the mind that if I even marry a Jewess, I'm going to try and convert her. And every Muslim in the family, everybody is interested. They say, why, what's wrong? Why don't you become a Muslim? As a married Christian, everybody, you know, my, if I'm a young man, my father, you know, my brother, my mother, everybody is, and the neighbors, everybody is, you know, keep on you know, eating the life out of the mm -hmm. person. Why, what's wrong? What's wrong, Mary? You know, why aren't you becoming a Muslim? What does that... So, you know, that is the attitude of the Muslim was to bring them in. Bring them in and convert them. Mm -hmm. The children, automatically, they will be following the Muslim religion. In the house of Islam, it was never expected that we will be in a state of minority anywhere at any time. You know, the attitude should be that we should... The religious religion as preached by God through Muhammad will prevail. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in other words, now autom or, or, automatically, automatically we'll all become Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, as such, we'll be all following the same rules and regulations. That is the idea. But now, in Western society, it is not so. So, there is a danger. I marry a Christian lady, 
and I have a few children. But in case a marriage breaks up, it can marriage marriage can break up between a Pakistani and a Pakistani, a Saudi and a Saudi, mm -hmm. and there'll be more reasons why it should break up between a person from another culture and another religion. There are more chances of the marriage yes, breaking up. Yes, that's absolutely. So if that happens now, according to the Western law, the woman takes the children with her. So I lost her. Motherhood. Motherhood, you see. So my children are gone. So my Fatimas and my Khadijas and my Muhammads are going to church. Because now, suppose now you with that lady and you go back, where do you go to? To your aunties and your grannies. And your aunties and grannies are going to church. So you take my children along with you. So over a period there will be brainwashing to Christianity. So the dangers are so great that they say, look, although there is a scope for marrying Jewesses and Christians, I am always telling to people, I say, please don't take a chance. Don't tempt providence. You say you're playing with fire. You know, this is going to come as a big surprise to you, but the Christians are saying the same thing to their children. Right? No, they have a right. And so no, the Jews. No, no, no right. No, no, I, it's I, true. Yeah. I, I, where is an act of, I say, look, self-preservation. You make a law, the Roman Catholic makes a law. I am not opposed to that. What I am saying is that, look, Islam is the religion that is destined to be the final religion of mankind. Reason. You see, it's the latest and it caters for all your problems. That's what I said at the beginning. Like, for example, you are an American, aren't you? You mm -hmm. are an American. Mm -hmm. Now, I just come from America. Yes. In November, I was there. And I came across certain statistics that there are in America today 7.8 million, 7.8 million more women than men. If more every, women than men. men. If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million women who will be sitting on the shelf mm -hmm. waiting for husbands, which they'll never get Start to start with. As if nature is taking revenge on the West, giving you more women than men, 7.8 million. And of the manpower you have in that mighty nation, 25 million are sodomites, gays. You call them gays. Mm -hmm. 25, another 25 million women who can't get husbands. Uh, as I don't know how many million that is, but they say something like million. 10 percent. Is that 25 million? I wouldn't know, ma'am. Yeah, you'll be able. 25 million sodomites, gays. Yes. Then 98 percent of your prison population is men. Then man gets cold feet for so many reasons. You see, he, he wants to marry, he wants to marry, and when you show him a bride, and he gets cold feet for some reason, he doesn't tell us why. But he gets cold feet, he, he, he backs up. But a woman, even if she's frigid, she wouldn't mind somebody giving her protection in marriage. You know, for marriage of convenience, maybe. You know, look, says, feed me, clothe me, house me, it's all right. I give in to the man, you know, for his pleasures, but she's prepared to marry, even a frigid woman. Generally, will, she doesn't mind getting a husband, but the man, he gets problems after problems. He's not sure of himself. So now, with that amount of surplus women in America, what happens? What is the answer? What did the Holy Ghost, because the Christians say if the Jesus was promising the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to come along and guide mankind into all truth. Two thousand years have gone. So I'm asking, what did the Holy Ghost tell any church in two thousand years? How to solve this problem of surplus women? You have more than thirty million women in America who can't get husbands. What do you do with them? Well, uh, the feminist women would say, who needs one? Uh -uh. And the traditional women would say that uh, if I, I can't speak for them, I can't speak for either group, but I would say that frankly and truly I honestly believe that the Holy Spirit draws, if you are filled with the idea that the love of God shines out of you, that there will be some man, some place, some time, under the grace of God who will be drawn, you know men are not stupid, if they find a lovely lady who is kind and who is loving and who is sweet and who likes to create a good home and who wants to be a good mother and who is perfectly willing to love and to cherish and to revere that gentleman there will somehow this thing in itself will draw a male creature right right but now what about the 30 million suppose in a perfect with this all the men that are there who are you know we haven't discounted as sodomites, mm -hmm. as prisoners, and so on and so on. So there'll still be 30 million women. If all those men get married, they find a 
brides, you know, the ideal brides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still, there'll be 30 million women who can't get husbands. Well, very well. Uh, through no, through no choice of my own, I assure you. Right it was necessary that I become divorced. And this is against everything that I believe in as a Christian woman. However, in the years since that I have lived with full joy in splendid isolation from the world of men in that way, although my work keeps me there all the time, there is a certain joy that in celibacy there is a, an intensification of the spirit which is I suppose in Roman Catholicism you would talk about priests and nuns, I'm not sure about Islam, whether you have people who practice celibacy or not, but it is a very, very noble, holy and lovely, wonderful thing. And you simply live what you feel that God wants you to do and what God wants you to be, and you can give back into the world a great deal of what you've received. I don't believe that this is a punishment or that this is a sin or that it's a that much of a terrible see, loss. the proof of the pies in the eating. You know, we find in Roman Catholicism, monkery and nunnery. In Islam it's forbidden. No monks and no nuns. Islam forbids you to do that because it's unnatural. Now, the proof that this is unnatural, you read the statistics today, how many percent of the priesthood are gays? When you don't allow them the natural uh, release, then they're going to find unnatural ways. Sodomites. How many sodomites are there in the Catholic Church, in the Anglican Church? So that is a proof that, look, the system is not natural. You're going, to, you're going to do things which are unnatural. Then, while in America, I was looking for Dr. Kinsey's book on the American female. You see, I had read it many years ago. Yes. Dr. Kinsey, uh -huh. The Life of the American Female. And I wanted to have possessed that book because I had read it and it belonged to a doctor friend. I gave it to him and since then I didn't see that book. I wanted Dr. Kinsey's. That's then I, I didn't find that. I went to most of the bookshops in New York and they say, well, it's on the computer, but it's, they haven't got it in stock. It's on the computer, but it's not in stock. Then I was forced to buy Masters and Johnson's. This is more up-to-date version of Kinsey, Masters and Johnson. And what I read there, you know, the American life, which is the same as the British life, you know, of, of sexology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or the German, or the French, they're all the same. Might be a one or two percent difference between one and the other. But generally, whatever is happening in America, whatever their norms will be the norms of the Western nations mm -hmm. in Europe. And I was actually horrified. Things I can't tell my audiences anywhere. What are I'm there, reading. Are there no gays in Islam? Oh, and are there... No, I can't say that. I mean, there would be. See, we said this new nation is an angel, an angelic nation. So we'll have our rotters, we'll have our black sheep, but now in the West, it is becoming the norm. You see, it's, it's the person, if your son is gay, you're not ashamed of it anymore. Among, in the house of Islam, everybody is, just, you know, it's, it's the most terrible thing no, if, but in, if in, my son was. No, in, in conservative Christianity, it is an abomination that right. says it's biblical. Right. That's the guy who preaches, you see, but now the guy who's practicing it, like our friend Swagat, and all the tele-evangelists, look, we, they were just caught out lately, one by one, a whole lot of them. Yes, sir. They were all leading unnatural lives, all. Reverend Corman, Jim Becker, <laughs> Jerry Falwell. I'm sorry. But that I, I, doesn't, that doesn't, no matter what they I, did, the Bible still says it's an abomination. Right, right, right. No, no, we accept that. But now, saying is one thing, and a solution to that. You see, Jesus Christ, he said beautiful things, says, do not look upon a woman to lust after her. Beautiful. Don't look to lust. What about beauty contest? What about long leg contest? We have in South Africa beach bum contest. Yeah, I know, right? I know, I know. So now, I said, now, Look, the Christian, he, 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 he hears the sermon on Sunday, even the priest, he's sermonizing you about thou shalt not look upon a woman to lust. And yet, in the evening, he's prepared to dance with his, uh, the wives of his congregation. Tell us your solution to what you have described as the, or shall we say, curse of America or this uh, big problem of America? An opportunity, I would say. You see, God Almighty, in His wisdom, He gave a solution to our problems. And we read this in the Bible, that almost every prophet of God had more than one wife. Abraham had three. 
Solomon had 1,000 wives and concubines. 1,000. David, his son, he had more than a dozen. In the time of Jesus, polygamy was practiced by the Jews. You see, uh, they come to Jesus, the Jews had come to him with a poser, with a riddle. They were asking him, he says, Master, there was a woman among us who had seven husbands, according to Jewish practice, that if one brother died and he left no offsprings behind, then the second brother will take her to wife and try to, I think yes. they call it live right marriage. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, according to that system, seven brothers, they went through this one woman, one after another. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the woman died and the seven brothers died. So, they came to ask Jesus that while they were alive, there was no problem because it was one by one. But they want to know from him that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her because they all had her here. That means seven brothers had this one woman. Now we do not, we can't imagine that in, among the Jews, the seven brothers were waiting in a queue for a brother to die before taking over the woman. Surely they had their own wives. See, they had their own wives and they were trying to do their duty simultaneously to this woman. And they failed. And another brother failed. And another failed. Polygamy was practiced in the whole Bible. There is not a single verse anywhere against polygamy. Jesus Christ never uttered a word about polygamy. Little wonder that he said, in my last interview I told you, that he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All truth means all your, all your problems, solution to all your problems. And is this a defensive role because the Prophet Muhammad had many wives, no, or is this... A, no, this is, a natural, this is a natural answer to a, a natural problem. We didn't create it. In America today, as I said when I visited the country, I discovered that there were 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. And in the city of New York alone, there are one million more women than men in the city of New York alone. One million more women than men. If every man in New York gets married, still be a million women who can't get husbands. Is there a, is polygamy a practice here in this Islamic community? No, no, hardly. It's, it's a hardly being practiced. It's what? It's hardly, hardly, rarely. Hardly. It's a rare thing. But this is a solution to a problem. We are not offering this as a tonic to the world, you have a problem. Britain has a problem. Europe has, uh, Germany has five million more women than men. Germany. In, in, in Britain, soon after the war, I'm reading that there were 1.6 million more women on the east coast of England alone than men. You have a problem. With the 7.8 million women in America, without husbands, then of the males in New York, one, one third are gays, sodomites. All right. Then, in the whole country, 25 million sodomites, gays. In other words, another 25 million women who can't get husbands. Plus the 7.8, you have another 25 million. Then your prison population, 98% are men. That mean, again, uh, they are discounted. Then, I'm telling you jokingly, but I think there's a many serious things are said in jest, that men get cold feet for so many reasons. I know. I've been trying to get guys married. And I know what happens. You know, everything is fine, fine, fine. He's jovial, he wants to. And then at the at last minute, the guy gets cold feet. He doesn't tell us why. Maybe at the back of the mind, he can't make the grade. He doesn't make a fool of himself. So he finds some excuse of getting out of it. So man, so many reasons. But the woman, even if she's frigid, she'll want to have somebody to give her protection. I arrived here on the, just before President de Klerk's speech. I immediately read all of the newspapers and listened to the radio, the TV, and what have you. And of course, one heard uh, everything about the point of view of the ANC, which is a political organization, UDF, PAC, right, right. and one heard the point of view of the government, right. and uh, this was in every front page everywhere. There was practically no mention whatsoever of the opinions of either the colored community, 
the Indian community or the Islamic community, okay. and there may be okay. others. Okay. I could not find really almost even a reference to it. So my first question on this subject, where is the Islamic community in politics in South Africa today? You see, as uh, numerically, numerically, the Muslim counts for nothing. The Muslims? We count for nothing. For nothing. Oh, is that so? How many? Because we are less than 2% of the total South African population. Oh, I less see. Than, and then this 2%, less than 2%, is divided in South Africa according to the uh, apartheid laws. We are divided in two, two major groups. One group is called Indian Muslim and the other is called colored Muslim. You see, they have divided the Muslims again into two sections. Mm -hmm. That less than 2% is further divided by the laws of the country into two other groups. One is called colored. They call them Malays. They are colored. They go as colored in this country according to the South mm -hmm. African laws. And the other, because most of us originate in India, Pakistan, we go as Indians. So now as Indians, we are shunted together with the other Indians, see, who, who happen to be 80% of the population, Indian population. Mm -hmm. So the Indian is a minority, and in that minority, the Indian Muslim is one-fifth. It's a minority of a minority in South yeah. Africa. Mm -hmm. So numerically, we don't count anything among... Uh, so why mention you? <laughs> that, that, that's one of the main reasons. Then the, the Malay, he's counted as a colored. So among the colored community is also a minority. Colored is a minority. It's a bigger minority than the Indian. They are almost about three million colored, mixed up between black and white. Among them, the Malay is also counted as a colored, but he's called Malay. But Malay means he's a colored, uh, I mean, he's a Malay Muslim with a colored identity. When you just say colored alone, it means a Christian colored. I see. And the Malay is a, a, a Malay colored. You know, for racially, he's a colored. He carries a colored identity card, mm -hmm. but religiously he's a Muslim, so they call him Malay, and the other Muslims here we call this Indians. So as such now, the Malay will have to start voting according to that colored group, whatever their votings are, you know, so they have this party and conservative party and nationalist party, so they start voting for them, and among the Indians they have the solidarity party and what, uh, all mm -hmm. NP, whatever they call them, they vote for that. So in other there is no other way that we can make our presence felt. But the Muslim, we believe that we have solution to the problems of South Africa. Which way? You see, when there's an identical situation that is prevailing in South Africa at the moment, where there is a huge black power and there is a huge white power, and they are in confrontation. They both are playing a game. I hope that you know something good comes out of this. There's some sincerity on both sides, and there is peace. Because if they both start going warring, then the rest of the community, we small people, will all get smashed mm -hmm. in this battle of the giants. Mm -hmm. But now the solution is an identical situation prevailed in Medina, when Muhammad went to Medina from Mecca, you know, when he had to make his flight. When he reached Medina, in Medina there were two tribes. Aus and Hajraj, these are the names, Aus and Hajraj. And they were also warring. Like here, the black upon black. The black man killing black man because, you know, you belong to a different political party. Mm -hmm. The killing is going on continuously. Mm -hmm. Similar thing prevailed among the Arabs. One tribe killing the members of the other tribe. Over little, little things. Until Muhammad set his sacred feet in Medina. And he offered them the book, the Quran. This is God's revelation to you. This is the rope of God. This is the rope of rescue. You hold this and be saved. So the Aus accepted Islam and the Khajarat accepted Islam. They held on to this rope and peace prevailed. So Islam has a solution to the problems of black and white. Because this is only, is, the people, there's a tug of war is going on. What can we get more? The white man wants to get the maximum from the black man, and the black man wants to get the maximum from the white man. It's natural. But now to do justice, we said, you see, both the people, they need Islam. The African and the Africana. Because Islam is the only religion which tells us, it said, look, we are all human beings from the same father. And a common form of worship that we get together. In the house of Islam, when you go even now, 
that you'll find that the African Muslim, the Malay Muslim, which is a colored, the Indian Muslim, and an occasional white Muslim, they're all praying together. But that does not happen in the churches. It's the Dutch Reformed Church. They have a Dutch Reformed Church for the whites, separate. For the Dutch Reformed Church for the colored, separate. Dutch Reformed Church for the Indian, separate. Dutch Reformed Church for the African, separate. They are all divided, though you have carried the same label. Same thing happens with the Catholic Church. The Mosuto Church is different from the Zulu Catholic Church and is different from the Colored Catholic Church. And this is the general practice. Linguistically, they are all separated. So still you feel that you are different from the other fellow. In the House of Islam, wherever you come from, like when I come to Geneva, the mosque, I am at home. The guy who might be leading us in prayer is, is an Arab. But it doesn't make any difference. I go to Nigeria. The African is leading me there. And in Tanzania, there's an African Imam. It doesn't matter because the form of worship that I'm used to is the same. Whether I go to Indonesia or India, Pakistan, wherever I go, there is a common denominator which Christendom cannot produce. There's no common denominator. All right. In this, you are your vote at this point then is not going to be that much significant. Significant. All right. So in what's going to happen, is there anything, just to have one word of economics, whether there was a still a free enterprise system or whether it was nationalization and total socialization with a slight communist overtone, does that make any difference to the Islamic population? Community, community. It'll make a big difference. And so what would you be for? Because we will go for free enterprise. Because as it is now, you know, there was a time when even the young people had certain ideals about Russia. Mm -hmm. And we can see the whole thing has crumbled to pieces. Yes. Because the thing is unnatural. You see, our wise men were telling us that this is unnatural, it can't stand. There is a law at work. And according to that law, this thing can't last. Mm -hmm. It lasted a long time, 70 years. But after 70 years, the thing has got to come to pieces. So he says, now you have an example to go by. This was your goal. The only perfect example you had of communism is falling to pieces. China is opening its doors. So now you want to experiment again. He's a fool. The man who wants to taste fire himself, he wants to burn his finger to find out where the fire burns. He's a fool. I said, learn from other people's experience. He said, look at it. Wherever they have practiced this communist system, in, in, in Mozambique, what has happened? In, in Tanzania, go and visit the place. I visited yes, the place. Yes, I did. I've been, I've been there twice, in Tanzania. And I was telling that anybody who wants to opt for that system, give them a free ticket, a holiday. They said, go to Tanzania and go and spend three months and come back. And then you tell me what, what type of system you want. Whether it is Mandela or anybody who talks about that system, I says, give them a free ticket to Tanzania and let them come back. Uh, with the that economics, and that's all we'll touch on that. So you, yes. this community would opt for the, the free, enterprise for free enterprise system. Enterprise. Groups of the UDF, uh, ANC, do any of them have any particular um, attitude toward Islam that would compare, for instance, I brought one of your uh, folders here. Yes. Uh, there are some things that, that uh, you say about the the Zionists or the Jews, right. which are very, very, very strong. Yes. And before we speak about that, I would like to ask if there are any of these other groups or the Christian groups who say anything that strong against Islam in this country. No, uh, you see, there is like an unwritten policy of the of, of uh, this Christian country to see that you know everything as as difficult as it is possible for them to make for us. Mm -hmm. But there is a freedom of religion in this country, which I have to take off my hat to, which is second to none in the world. Freedom of religion is that in so? this country, freedom of to preach. You see, freedom of religion. As a young man, I was reading the communist uh, constitution, and so Article so and so tells us, and I read it, and I, I, uh, that there is freedom of religious practices and anti-religious propaganda. I'm quoting. Mm -hmm. freedom of religious practices and anti-religious propaganda. So I thought, well, uh, look, we both have a fair chance. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand that it says freedom of religious practices. That freedom is given to you, but not to preach. And 
and anti-religious propaganda. While the 4,000 Muslims are going into the mosque for prayer, the guy outside can make a noise and say, hey, there's fools there, look what they're doing. This is how they pray. They can make a mockery of it. But I can't come out and say, hey, look, man, come inside and I will tell you, you know, how to get peace. But the system that it's we are one-sided deal. It's one-sided. Mm -hmm. But in South Africa, when they say there's freedom of religion, they do really give it to us. In other words, I go to the city hall of Cape Town, which I did go to, and I organize a, a lecture there, Christianity, Communism or Islam, which has the answer to the problems of South Africa. And this city hall of Cape Town is a stone's throw from Parliament House mm -hmm. in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And I delivered a lecture to a packed audience there. Christianity, Communism or Islam. And since the speaker is a Muslim, it's understood automatically that it is not Christianity, it it's is not, not communism, communism, Islam is the answer. Yes. Right. And no interference from the government on any level, no interference. Then we had a conflict with the government twice. Twice we had a conflict with the government on our publications. One was in 1982, I published a pamphlet, The Crimes of Begin. You know, yes, the Sabra and Shatila Massacre. Begin. Right. Menachem Begin, his, his crimes, the crimes of Begin. And that pamphlet, the Jews had it brought up before the publication was born. Mm -hmm. And they had it banned. We made representation, but our representation, I mean, I blame my soldier, you know, my lawyer. I lost the case. Then the government, the, the Christians now this time, they took up another of my publication called Crucifixion or Crucifixion. It sounds the same, like a riddle, it's not. Crucifixion, the first is F-I-X-I-N, fiction, to fix a man on the cross and kill. And the other fiction is F-I-C-T-I-N, fiction means a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Is it a fiction to fix and kill, or is it a fiction, a fairy tale? Mm -hmm. That's the title of my book. And some missionaries, they brought it to the attention of the public, director of publication. The director of publication read it, and he directed his board in Pretoria. He is in Cape Town, he directs his board in Pretoria, he says, ban the book. The board goes to the book and they say, look, this is not very pleasant. We don't like this book. It's a very important book undermining our foundation of our faith, which is the crucifixion. Death and resurrection of Christ is the foundation and this book undermines that. It's a very dangerous book. But it does not infringe any law. So we can't ban it. So the director of publication went on appeal against his own board. You know, this is something unique. To me, it's a unique thing. In any country in the world, the director says, ban, the thing is banned. You can go and fight it out afterwards. But this, the director goes on appeal against his own board. In that case, he's going to hire an advocate to represent him against the board, to convince them that the book should be banned. So for the first time, the board informs us that, look, this is what has transpired so far. If you want to defend your book, you come along and defend it yourself. We will not play the devil's advocate on your behalf. So we went and defended our book, and we won the case against the government. So to me, there is that freedom, if you can play the game according to the rules uh, of, the, uh, of the game, there is nothing for you to worry about. Now this is a very good entrance, what you have just described, that you held the cruci fiction yes. up, and you made your case, which right. I believe when I read something about that, uh, that Jesus appeared, you you believe, as dressed as the gardener when it said that right, uh, right. the ladies uh, thought he was He's the gardener. It's because be the gardener. he was not, yes. Right. And it goes on like that. You have said that in the name of freedom of speech, right. even though that was an abomination right. unto Christians, right. they allowed you they allowed. and you won your case. Right. May I move now to Rushdie right. and the fact that. He has printed something which I assume, I have never read it and I don't intend to, right, right. is equally as, quotes, insulting right. to the Islamic religion right. as that uh, would be to the Christian. Right. And yet he is under penalty of death. Right. And you are not under penalty of no, death. No. No. For having said right. this. Right. Could you lead us into this discussion using those two cases? Yes. yes. You see now, in the case, the government says, in my case, about my book, mm -hmm. that this is a bona fide belief. I'm not trying to make a mockery of the Christian. See, just I want to be funny, I want to be clever. They say, hey, look, this is nonsense, man. How can one man 
you know, take the sins of the world. You know, this is taking you, the Christianity is taking a thousand million people for a ride on the cross. Yeah, I believe it. Right, no, right. But now that I'm making a mockery. In there's a law in the country, you are not to sneer at somebody else's religion. Mm -hmm. What I was telling was a bona fide belief, because my book says, Wama kataluhu wama salabuhu, which means they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. My book says that. This is my belief. A, a, a bona fide belief. So as such now, I'm expounding it. If it goes against you in that case, I just can't help it. This is the belief that's given to me by my faith, and a thousand million people believe in it. In the case of Rushdi, it is not that. See, he has gone out of his way to abuse everybody. Like, for example, in South Africa, we had the book banned, just like that. See, there's a law. The law is there, and according to that law, we succeeded. You are not to sneer at somebody else's belief. Right? This guy here, the races. You know, our biggest problem is race, as I said in my previous interview. Everywhere is a race. This man is the greatest racist. You know, he beats Hitler's main cop. We show to the director, look what this guy says. He says, nigger, eat white man shit. Is it right, sir? The guy says, no. This is rank racism. He's a racist himself, but <laughs> this is rank racism. Then he says, black shit is bad. He calls them niggers, he calls them coons, he calls them what and what not. Right? So they said, no, ban the book. Ban the book. This is not right. Then he's used certain type of language. One word. No, which we don't for want which, to use. No. For one word, Lady Chatterley's lover was banned in this country for 20 years. Mm -hmm. That word he uses 55 to 57 times in his book. Forgetting that he's besmirching the characters of the Islamic faith, you know. Uh, our spiritual mothers, the wives of the Prophet, the Prophet himself, then the Prophet Abraham, and the companions of the Prophet, the thing that he calls them, this is, which makes anybody's blood boil, especially the Muslim. But besides that, what he has done to everybody, the white man, the white woman, the Jews, he has not spared anybody. But the problem with, with, the, with the people outside, the, the, in the Western countries, Nobody brought this to the attention of the people there. We only cried about ourselves. We said, look, he saw my mother. Who? It's Aisha Siddiqa, wife of the Prophet. Said, Where is she? You know, she can swim. I said, no, no, she's dead. So how long? 1400 years. So does it hurt her? The guy's making a mockery of it. See, it's, it's uh, a mockery now. This, this, does it hurt her? Now you're making a mockery of it. But now if I turn the tables, it would be different. I said, you know, sir, I told the people in Britain, I went around on a lecture tour. I'm telling them, I says, you know what he says about Mrs. Margaret Thatcher? So what does he say? So I said, you he calls her torture. Full stop. One word sentence, torture. Then he says, Maggie the bitch. Maggie the bitch. Three word sentence. Maggie the bitch. I said, is it right? I said, you people should have gone to Mrs. Thatcher and says, Ma, with an open book, the satanic verses, says, Ma, look, this fellow is calling you a bitch. Is it right, Ma? But maybe you can take it. You know, you are great. You are the Iron Lady. You know, to you is nothing. But what about the, feeling, the feelings of your dear son, Mark? Somebody calling him son of a bitch. What about his feelings? What about your daughter, Carol? What about her feelings? Shh, the book would have been bad. You know what he does with the Queen? He cohibits with her in the book. He makes tender love to her <laughs> and he joins with her. But so. uh, Mr. Didar, if I may say so, yes. you see, as a Christian, right. uh, professing and believing, uh, Christianity and everyone connected with it have been reviled by so many people, right. so much literature and so many people in the world that not only do we have uh, mud of every kind of description in the world thrown on Jesus Christ, thrown on the church, thrown on individual Christians, martyrs, anybody else. Right. The, it doesn't, I mean, it, it sheds off your back like water because you expect it of anyone for any reason that they choose. And the second thing is, as Christians, we are then called upon, no matter how vile the treatment 
to the Christian religion or to the Christian himself to arrive at the point where we can express total forgiveness for that person because if there is a God who says judge not lest ye be judged even though we all do it every day 25 times right, right. we are called upon to rise above this and even to pray for that man that God in his own wisdom and infinite way through the grace of the Holy Spirit will touch that man whether he's Islam or whether he's uh, whether it's Judaism or what that that person who is reviling first of all his reviling against us isn't going to hurt him but when that guy gets in front of God Almighty at least in the Christian religion he is in far bigger trouble than anything we can do on earth right. and even if we killed this man and yes. now I'm coming to your yes. to the sentence of death yes even if we killed this man in a sense in a pure Christian sense we are interfering with the law of God because God himself in his infinite wisdom will judge him even if Rushdie had done that and if the book never got published if he had written it in a closed room and no one had ever read it God himself would still be the judge of Mr. Rushdie so having said that you appreciate what I mean when I say as a Christian it's very hard to get so worked up about it no matter how awful it is when we've been experiencing that for 2,000 years you see, what you and have so have the Jews Islam has said terrible things about the Jews they, they've said it in your literature that they are absolutely some of the things are, are what are they're doing now at the moment the way they're behaving so worse than the Nazis well, but some proof. of the things you say about them are things the Nazis said about the Jews. If it is true, you see, if it is true that they are doing the things worse than what the Nazis did, then if it's hurting the guy, me speaking the truth, is it true that if the guy who doesn't pay taxes in, in, in Palestine, in, in Gaza and the West Bank, that person is thrown out of the house, they confiscate his property and they bulldoze the house. Is there any country in the world that does that? If you don't pay the tax, they catch you and take you to jail. Yes, out right. here they bulldoze, right. they bulldoze shacks in right. in uh, townships, and uh, people have had no, been for not kicked out taxes. of their there, Listen, for you can you can pa there are laws in the United States if you uh, what don't do you pay call your it? tax. It's, no condemnation, or they they condemn property and so no, 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 on. That, no, that is a different thing. Then you compensate them. You say, look, this 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 building we need. We want to demolish this, so we want to make a highway. Yeah, I'm not for, defending For, for, for public, this thing is a look, here is a compensation for that. But this is the person who doesn't pay the tax. You kick his wife and children out. You take his fridges away. You just can't imagine. You break people's bones. I've got films. All right. films. I agree right. with that. All right. of that is so terrible. Now, when I tell you, I said, you are doing something worse than what the Nazis did to you. You should be the last people to behave like that. Because you went through hell. I sympathize with you. And now you are doing the same thing and worse than the Nazis. So now, if it hurts you, I say it's just too bad. But now, am I speaking the facts or lies? I give you proof from your own writers. Okay, but what about Islamic people? And I would bring no, no, in Christians no, if, if they, I could. No, who, who have done terrorist no, acts no, and innocent people. Culpable, and what? culpable, culpable. If you catch the terrorist, according to the rules of your, your country, you have every right to do what you like. If you say, look, there's no death penalty in Israel, there is no death penalty. Death penalty. Right. Okay. No, it's not my fault. That's your law. But to me now, if that guy killed innocent children, if I catch him, I'll hang him. You see? If I, but you say, no, there's no death penalty. So what do you put him in life prison? So that's your business. That is your law. But that is not the law as given by God. The law of God says life for life. But now we're coming back to Rushdie. But that's Jewish law too. And that's I for Jewish an law. Right, 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 right. So now, if you don't want to follow your law, that's your business. I can't force you to follow your law. But now we also have a law that for certain blasphemies against God and His messengers, the punishment is death by crucifixion or by hanging or by chopping off the hands and feet from opposite ends. Very cruel. But now, treason. To us, this is treason against the Ummah. Ummah means the community, the religious community. You have a law treason against the state for which you know you had the Nuremberg trial you had Lord Ho Ho you know mm -hmm. that Britisher who was broadcasting from Berlin yes. you had him killed that uh, that Irishman you know who tried to you know create bring a, uh, some freedom for the uh, you had him hang or shot 
So in other words, not every country in the world you have a law and you behave according to your law. Now, in the case of well, this devil here, he's broken all the laws, but now I'm not crying about that. What I'm telling is that the way to approach the white man, the westerner, is to show him where it hurts him. Because I'm told, like you said just now, that the people are insensitive. Look, you can swear Christ and you can do this and do that and get away with it. Not no, get no, away with no, it, no, but no. But, uh, right. but now, there is a law of blasphemy in, in England. Mary, Mrs. Mary Whitehouse, you know, she took the gay magazine to court for using certain blasphemies against Jesus and she won the case. But now there's nothing to protect the Muslim feelings. It's only Anglican, England has got only something to protect the Anglican Christian. Not us. We are more, there are more Muslims in Britain than Methodists. But our feelings are not considered at all, as if, as if we are human beings. So now I said, that is no sense in me crying about that. But you people, the Westerner, is also sensitive. Where it hurts him. So I show you, I said, look, he's not altogether insensitive. About religious matters, the bulk of the people are irreligious. So it's only a name. You're Christian, you only feel census forms. Mostly you say you are a Christian. But in your hearts of hearts, you are not a Christian. You are a Christian in the sense that you are not a Muslim, you are not a Jew. In that sense, you are a Christian, but in your hearts and mind, it has no, nothing to do with your practical life. Generally, this is what I see. So now I must show you where it hurts you. So I am showing you. I said, look, you people are highly sensitive people. You see? Because my people say, we are also saying, these British are insensitive. I said, no, they are not insensitive. You try and say certain things about them and they'll break your jaw for you. Don't try. But you have to tell him what? He said, look, sir, open the book. The very first page, the very first page of Satanic Verses. He calls Londoners. I was in the city of London, in the Royal Albert Hall. I said, I take it that most of you are Londoners. Whether you're a Pakistani Londoner or a Sikh Londoner or an English Londoner, you are all Londoners. They say, yes. We are all Londoners. As he called you Londoners bastards. First page. You feel anything? Of course you feel. You see that? No. Some, no, no, no. That's, you are talking from a, a different... You are personally involved and now he tells you, you bastards, you feel something. The people say they feel it. In America, when I'm telling the Afro-American, he, say, he says, nigger, eat white man shit. I said, you feel anything? They said, yes. He calls you coons, <laughs> he calls you <laughs> your own ooga booga and what, what. Do you feel anything? He said, yes. While I landed there in, in, in America, the same day I buy the USA Today. And what I find? That in Houston, uh, Mr. Westmoreland, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, somebody like a... A general, like a, a general no, Westmoreland? Uh, no, this man is like a mayor of, oh, of okay. Houston. Uh -huh. So there was a discussion about this fellow, um, that Afro-American who went to Utopia and the plane fell for the United Nations and he died. Yes, yes, I remember so that. You remember him. So now they wanted to name the Houston airport after his name, Leland. Leland, Leland, yes. you see? Leland. So they want to make it Leland International instead of Houston International. So this man, Westmoreland, said, why not call it Nigger International? And the whole of the Afro-Americans. Well, they, they should have. That's exquisite bad manners. No, it's no, awful. No, no. To me, what is, look, they call me coolie here. And I laugh it off. So they call you nigger. They say, so laugh it off. I said, mm, something serious. They call you Uncle Tom. I says, no, it's just something serious. I didn't know. So they call you Uncle Tom, so what? You become Uncle Tom? No, no. It depends on the person. The one at the receiving end. How does he feel? So when I'm presenting it to this guy who calls you such and such, how do you feel? He calls you Americans. I dare not say what he calls the Americans. You see? What he calls the British. But everybody hates the Americans. No, 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 everybody. No, no, even then. Let the, you know that the whole world hates. But if I use that word, you see, if it was your son, though he's doing religion, he might punch me on the jaw. Do you know what they say about this program? The people that don't like no, it? No, no, no. They call it no, terrible. No, no, no. But now, personal, you see, it's not personal. This is impersonal thing. The program is rubbish and like this and like that. People can say anything about Ahmadi that you. But when it comes to something personal, talking about your mother, talking about your wife, your sister, your daughter, then the man reacts. 
and if he punches you on the jaw, he is justified. You see? So now I only have to remind the British, this is what this guy says about you, sir. This is what he says, you American, this is what he says about you, sir. And everywhere where I went around, they are 100% behind me. He says, no, this is not done. This is not done. I agree, it's not done. So now it's the guy who does it. Very no, bad no, manners. The, the guy must pay the price. So I said, look, maybe, maybe, you see, now you are, you have cultivated yourself into a type of mentality, you have heard so much things thrown at you. So like here now, you call me a coolie. It's an insult. Are you saying coolie? Coolie, yes. Coolie means a laborer, literally. Yeah, like, like, a, like the Chinese coolie. Like cool, and here, yes, okay. the Indians were brought here to, for indented laborers cutting sugar cane. So they call them coolies. They call them coolies. Right. I see. So I didn't know out that. Out of that, the, every Indian becomes a coolie. You see, I see. in the eyes of okay. the white man. All right. Every Indian. So there was a time when I used to react. But now I reached a stage now. <laughs> so I said, you are also coolie. See, now I'm a bit clever now. I said, you are also coolie. I said, don't you labor? See, I said, well, that's what it means. You are a laborer. But I know when he says coolie, he's trying to hurt me. And then it hurts. You see, the word itself is nothing. Like the Englishman calls the Africana in South Africa, Bura. Bura means a farmer. They are farming people as a whole. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But when the Englishman says Bura, at the back of his mind, he's backward. A rustic. That's what he's saying. You know, a, a simpleton. That's what he's saying when he says Bura. Well, so the meaning, the meaning, the word, there's nothing wrong with the word, but when you are uttering it, it conveys certain meanings. Same thing to the Africana, he calls the English people Ruinek. Ruinek. Ruinek means rednecks. Oh, Ruinek. Ruinek. Yeah. Yes. Okay, rednecks. In, 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 in Africans, it means rednecks, mm -hmm. meaning you are all softies. You go in the sun a little and you get red in the get neck. Red, red you know? the like the red Indians called you pale face. Pale face, and you call them red Indians. Right? I don't know whether there's any sting in the, in the word pale face, but now in this no. word, no. But in the word ruinek, there is a sting. In the word bura, there is a sting. In the word coolie, there is a sting. Now, because there is a sting in it, it stings. It hurts. It's not because there is a sting. When you utter it, you want to hurt me, so it hurts me. Sticks and stones may break my uh, bones, but, but words, but words will no, never hurt. That's a philosophy. No, no, look, it's true. It's a philosophy. But uh, even so, you know, I'm. Uh, the, uh, people call wasps, you know, right. white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Right. I'm a wasp, right. and everything about the wasps is yeah. bad. They right. sting, right. they do right. all this right. business, right. everything is bad. Now, if I spent the le rest of my life right. huddled in a corner, uh -huh. crying or afraid to walk out yeah. because God borned me, right. a white Anglo-Saxon right. Protestant, right. I wouldn't ever go out. I wouldn't do anything. Right. I can still love the people right. who don't like the program and right. who call me a wasp right. and right. who don't like right. uh, older white ladies right. or whatever you call it, right. or call me a prude, right. 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 or call me... A, there are a thousand bad words you right. could apply to right. me, I'm right. quite sure. Right. But I simply must feel and think of myself as much as I can live it as a child of God who is trying the best I can with all of my faults to live as I believe that God made me to live and love my fellow man and if they sling filth and mud and and I've had injustices inside my family, right, outside right, my family, right, right. in my work, in my business but I must forget and forgive as fast as possible. Do you not feel that 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 the Moham that God as the Mohammedans Muslims, Muslims uh, see him yes and experience him, yes. would he not have forgiveness in his heart and soul? Oh, I'm not no, calling no, no, no. it good. Forgiveness no. for God, he can forgive whom he likes. Uh -huh. right. But now, without the law, you see, we say we have no right to forgive. For example, a man commits murder. I like that fellow. I'm a judge. I like that murderer. For some reason, previous uh, reason, uh, my contact with the man. But now the evidence that is brought before me is that cold-blooded murder the man committed. Mm -hmm. Must I pass judgment on him or not? You see, I am a servant of the law. The law. The law. I must carry out the law. I love the man, but I can't help it. He can be my son. I can't help it. You have to apply the I law. I have to apply the law. Now, God Almighty, in His wisdom, He can forgive. That's His business. He can reward him a million fold on the other side. He said, look, I think you were a bit harshly treated, my son. You know, you deserve heaven and hoodies and gardens flowing with milk and honey. That's his business. 
but no. The man commits treason if the law of the land says he should be shot. It's not for me to say, look, this guy built so many hospitals and he's been running orphanages. Did he commit that act of treason or not? What is the law? The law says shoot him. So now I carry out the law. See, and all those people in South Africa have people outside the country right. who committed treason and they committed murder. Yeah. Uh, the the Afrikaners or the the white South Africans have a hit squad of some kind that right, right, right. and, and yeah. th those men committed murder. Right. Now, would you, under the laws of Islam, would they all be put to death? Or would one side be forgiven and the other side not be forgiven, or would they all be amnesty? I, th I, I, I think, you see, because to me, if I look at it, that this was a war, undeclared war between the two. Yes. So as such, to me, this was war, and now we have come to a, uh, the war has come to a halt. He says, forget about the past, and let's reconstruct the country with, on, a, on a new uh, principle of forgive and forget. So I you would wipe out both sides? Both sides I would wipe out. Because if I said, if you, if you have to punish the one side, you must punish the other side. And there's no end to it. There won't be any end to that. So recrimination carries on and it can still re lead to further bloodshed. So with all the, let's assume for a moment, and this is assumption, I'm not making accusation, let's assume that there were X numbers of murders committed on the outside uh, revolutionary side and X number of murders committed on the inside white police squad. Everybody should be equal and they should all Just be... Just forget about the thing and carry on from here. Now. But Mr. Rushdie should be executed. Oh no, he's, he's a different case altogether because now he is not repentant at all. He is going on further and further. He wants to broadcast this further, yeah. more and more. This is greed of gain. You see, 40 people have already paid with their lives. 40 Muslims have died. So many women have been widowed, so many children often, because of his pen, poison pen. How? 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 I didn't know that. How did they... In India, in Pakistan, you didn't hear about the protest marches, and they were shot down because now they are marching onto the British embassy, or they are marching onto the American embassy. I see what you so mean. the government now is forced to say, stop it, and the guys are worked up. They want to go and march and lay the protest, so they are shot okay. by their own governments, but 40 people have given their lives for this one man's mischief. Okay, but look at all the hundreds of people that gave their lives on both sides for the ANC, and I'm just using that as an example, it could be the others too, and the white hit squads. Well, uh, they, uh, yes, women well, and children see, in supermarkets 40, 40 and everything. 40 Muslims have died. Yeah. Rushdie, he's in safety, he's enjoying having a jolly good time with his millions. And he's uh, unrepentant. He said, look, he has done something that is right. So he said, look, this guy, he is uh, more dangerous to me than Hitler's armies. We have been visiting today with Sheikh Al-Hajj Ahmed Didat, president of the Islamic Propagation Center International in Durban, South Africa, on the 16th day of February 1990. Thank you. I'm sure we could go on for another hour or two oh, no. with all of the things that we have. But thank you, Mr. Didat, for the time you have given us today. God bless. Thank Good night.